Welcome to the pre-recording of lecture 2 of MCS 481, a course which is an introduction to computational geometry. So in the previous lecture we defined the notion of convex hull and illustrated a very first basic algorithm uh, which had a cubic cost, cubic in the size of the input, uh, worse than any sorting algorithm you may have seen. So in some sense that was to motivate also a little bit the attention that must be given to constructing good algorithms. So we will be using the software Seagull. Um, so there is as in every lecture, there will be a software demonstration, not at the end as today. So today I will give the demonstration uh, right at the beginning. Uh, the main focus of this point is to, of this uh, lecture, is to make our first serious algorithm. So we will uh, present the main ideas to formulate the algorithm, to prove the correctness, and then also to analyze the cost. It will turn out that we can compute convex hulls of point sets in the plane in a cost that is the same as the best sorting algorithms. So that is the conclusion of the lecture. So what is the problem again? So here is the specification of input and output. So this slide is in a way the summary of uh, the previous lecture. So we have on input a set of points in the plane. Um, so a finite set. I should say that this uh, fancy R here is uh, the mathematical notation for the real set. Uh, computational geometry and also Seagal focuses on exact computations. Uh, so the inputs that we will consider will be mostly integer points. Integer points and we will work with arbitrary precision. So the input is a set of points, uh, not ordered. Um, so you could see this uh, problem as a sorting problem. We will sort the points in a geometric way, in clockwise fashion, so that any two consecutive points in the list on output, they define a line segment, and that line segment spans an edge. The line segment, if you expand it into an entire line, defines a half plane. And an edge is uh, a line segment so that all the points lie at the same side of the edge. That was also important uh, last time that we defined what that meant. So. We have the list of points. Uh, there is this modulo computation here. So the last point is linked to the first point. Uh, so the last point and the first point in that order also define a clockwise uh, edge of this convex hull. So there is the input output and one can also use this as the definition what is the convex hull as a list defined in a list representation a list of tuples uh, if you like. Okay um, here is an example uh, 10 points 10 um, points drawn here in the plane. Uh, four of those points lie in the strict interior of this uh, polygon and we order the points in a clockwise fashion. So the points that are connected here with the arrows, uh, so the arrows may uh, remind you of vector calculus, um, so that is useful. Uh, 
so the vectors have a beginning and an end point. Uh, so we orient, we sort uh, the points in this list. So to introduce the algorithm, uh, if you start walking uh, on the edges of this convex hull, you can start at the left or you can start at the right. So if you start at the left, you actually construct what we will call the upper hull, the upper part. And when you start from the right and you walk until you turn, so you turn um, until you start to turn back again with the x-coordinate, uh, you have the lower hull. So we will define an algorithm which constructs the upper hull and the lower hull. Um, we ended the last lecture with uh, degenerate inputs. Uh, so, and the first case of degenerate inputs were actually exact inputs. And here is a lattice polygon. Um, in algebraic geometry, we call it a Newton polytope. Uh, defined uh, by the exponents of a polynomial in two variables. You can see that all the points where all the monomials where y appears, uh, they will be represented by these points here. And essentially this is one edge. Uh, but if you're not careful, uh, that edge will be reported multiple times. Uh, so we call this a degenerate case. Uh, now, of course, most lattice polygons, if you generate random points with very uh, small exponents, think about nice polynomials, then most of these uh, lattice polygons, they are actually uh, degenerate in a way. So, Another case um, that we will sweep under the rug, uh, so we will um, assume that such cases will not occur uh, in first. So here you have uh, a problem with approximate uh, coordinates. Uh, so if all the points are lined up, uh, then it could be you could shift somewhere and uh, you could make two mistakes you could report too many or too few edges. All right. Um, to deal with those two cases, uh, we define a general position. So an input set is in general position if there are no collinear points. Uh, so that means no three points lie at the same line. Uh, something that is not in general position is called degenerate. Uh, so we kind of uh, first, when we design our algorithms, we think about the general position. Then the second case uh, with the approximate input uh, refers to robustness. If you are close to a degenerate case, then you don't want your algorithm to fail. So an algorithm is robust if it doesn't fail for small perturbations of degenerate inputs. Okay, uh, I said in the beginning we, we would do a software demonstration, so I'm close to 10 minutes in. Uh, so let's uh, go to the computational geometry algorithms library. So this course is um, on the intersection of mathematics and computer science. Um, uh, mathematics means that we look at uh, geometric problems. We care a lot about definitions, also about proofs. Uh, it's not that type of mathematical course where we, where we do all our computations by hand. Uh, so we uh, look at uh, the use throughout this course. We will uh, systematically or more or less systematically connect everything that we see all the algorithms to the uh, software. So it's not a programming course in that sense either. Uh, it would be good to program all the algorithms 
and if you have a lot of time this is certainly recommended but uh, for this course we will go to Seagull so Seagull is free and open source uh, so there is the documentation so I prepared this now in the previous pre-recording I kind of got uh, stuck a little bit but here I have the right pages set up so the one of the suggested activities for the last for the first lecture uh, was to browse through uh, Seagull Seagull is extensive and uh, it may take a while to orient yourself a little bit uh, we will orient ourselves towards uh, Seagull uh, to the topics um, so here I have also prepared myself uh, with the correct pages so even if you don't install Seagull from source it is very useful to look at the examples uh, so here actually see the you see the example that I was using in the previous lecture uh, so this was the uh, array convex hull 2 so given a sequence of five points you see the the code is actually was smaller than the Python code that we saw you have five points and you construct uh, the convex hull of it um, in C++ code so even if you don't compile and if you don't want to install everything github is very convenient uh, to look at uh, the code to browse the code um, so we will see the algorithm um, so the other algorithm that we have covered or the algorithm that we will actually be uh, applying is the Graham uh, Andrew algorithm so the algorithm attributed to Graham and Andrew I will list the references um, so here you see uh, an input output uh, also a very short uh, program that um, takes points on input on an input file and writes uh, them to output file uh, I'm sorry uh, it reads from standard input and it writes to standard output but I will show how to use this with files and the redirection okay uh, the documentation I mentioned Graham and Andrew um, so uh, there is the uh, bibliography so uh, the main results in um, computational geometry started to occur in the 70s uh, so here you see the paper of uh, Graham and then there is the paper by Andrew uh, so these are two fundamental papers um, but you see uh, the last paper is actually the quick hull algorithm uh, so I mentioned also the quick hull algorithm last uh, time so quick hull is wrapped in the scipy uh, package in the spatial module um, okay that is the browsing uh, let me now go back to the Jupyter lab environment I have prepared a Jupyter notebook uh, there is the compiled code um, so what I did in this course in the previous run of the course I downloaded uh, Seagull entirely and then I ran everything from the examples folder what I try to do now is uh, picking from the examples folder and copying those programs that I want to demonstrate um, so here you see the compilation done with the make file um, I installed Seagull on an Ubuntu um, version um, on the Windows subsystem for Linux uh, it also needs GMP and you need to link with GMP for the arbitrary precision integer arithmetic so that is a program that needs to be compiled the program that are shown uh, in the Jupyter notebook I can see that all the files are there so let me run this so here you see the files that are relevant so I have the CPP 
uh, the C++ code, so that's the extension CPP here. There is the input file, so the input file, uh, we're all very familiar with Python, so we can read all the lines, and you can see indeed, these are all integer points. That's the input file, there is the executable, and then there is the output file uh, that is there. So here you see the input file. More than 500 points, actually not so interesting to look at. Uh, the length is important, so I've saved it into input. You can also look at the output file. And how was this actually created? Uh, so um, I tried to run this in a Jupyter notebook, but that didn't really run that well. So you can run it uh, from C in to C out. And now I have the from C in to C out. So notice the less than is the redirection of the input. And I have the redirection of the output for with the larger than symbol. If I didn't make any type errors and I didn't, uh, then you see that everything goes out uh, goes very very fast and I can look at this uh, for the output file I will see uh, about 50 points that are out there so here you see the output uh, sorted uh, you see that we start with the point with the smallest x coordinate uh, so uh, that will be the algorithm. It computes first the upper hull or first the lower hull. You see that the Y coordinate actually uh, seems here to go down. Uh, that is interesting. Um, okay, um, so we end at the last point, um, or actually not. Uh, so I'm actually now myself a little bit confused uh, so we have the okay so we have the uh, upper hull that stops at the point with the largest coordinate uh, the largest first coordinate and then we go down again that's how it goes uh, so that's the uh, lower hull okay um, so let me return back to the slides. So this was a very brief introduction to the code and uh, in this computational course, uh, so it's not a software course uh, either, so studying Seagal uh, to the point where we know the ins and outs of it is also actually not really the point, Seagal is huge, but uh, still it is a great tool and uh, we will examine the properties of the algorithms in the computer projects. In particular for this lecture, uh, the main conclusion is that we can compute convex hulls in the plane in time n log n. Uh, so the first project might actually experiment this, take larger and larger, so here the 500 was actually not that large as an input, but take millions of points, take two millions of points, what happens with the output time. Okay, um, time for now the second part of this presentation. So let's look at an incremental algorithm. So what is an incremental algorithm? An incremental algorithm works incrementally. Uh, that's kind of a not so helpful definition, but it will update the output uh, successively step by step. Um, so we will first, uh, you could also see this as a proof by induction. You look at something that is small. Can you do this for three points? Can you, can your algorithm uh, compute convex hulls that are triangles. Um, if you can do that, then you can uh, go to the next case. Question here, uh, what is the simplest case? Uh, what are uh, the base cases? Um, so let's see. 
Um, upper and lower hull. Uh, these are actually the two uh, cases that we consider. So for the running example, the 10 random points that I considered earlier, uh, we consider the computation of the upper hull, uh, also called the upper envelope, um, and the lower envelope. Uh, you see that the upper hull is here rather simple, uh, just two vectors, starting at the leftmost point, and we start at the, if there are two leftmost points, like here, uh, so again I was using an integer a random number generator when I prepared the slides, and you can see that in some sense this is already a little bit of a special case, but in case that there are two points with the same first coordinate, pick the uh, one which is highest, so that gives you a unique point. Uh, the same you do for the rightmost point. Okay, so there is already a sorting that is taking place. Uh, so we will sort first all the points on the x-coordinate. Uh, so that is a pre-processing step. And then we will process the points that are sorted now with the x-coordinates first from left to right, and then we process them from right to left. So uh, the definitions, uh, they need to be happening in words as well. Um, so it's the upper hull is that part of the convex hull, so it's the sublist of the um, upper hull, where you start from the left, it's the sublist of the convex hull. So the L is here referring to the list representation, uh, convex hull represented as a list of tuples, ordered clockwise. And might be that Seagal does it in counterclockwise, uh, but it's either way. Um, lower hull uh, is uh, the mirror of this. So this is the definition of upper hull and lower hull as the special cases of the convex hull. Uh, so I actually showed uh, the compiled uh, version, so I actually wasn't really done uh, with the, I showed the compiled code. Uh, perhaps I didn't actually sh show the, uh, what actually I want to show with the demonstration here is that if you look into the Python interface, uh, the Python interface has two functions lower hull points and upper hull points. The fact that this algorithm runs in two stages, uh, in the, as a, if you use the Python interface, you can compute the lower hull points and the upper hull points separately. So there are algorithms, the newton puiseux algorithm on algebraic geometry, where you start only from the lower hull. That can save you time. Okay, I should actually have s continued the demonstration, so let me uh, continue this. So, um, in so this is a Jupyter notebook with a Python kernel. Uh, so you can install uh, also the Python interface very quickly uh, with the package managers, um, either pip or conda. Um, if I'm doing the help, uh, so what I did was looking at the example that was posted explicitly um, on the uh, documentation, uh, the example that I showed last time. So we had the convex hull underscore two. And I noticed there is Graham Andrew, uh, there's Graham Andrew scan. And you see that the help is rather uh, very short. Uh, that's not because Seagal is not well defined, is not well documented, it's extremely well documented, but it's because of the, the way the bindings were done. The bindings were done automatically, and in that sense, uh, there is actually a rather straightforward mapping between uh, the Python code, the structure of the Python code, and also the um, original Seagal code, the way it should probably be. So here we had our example. 
uh, we are uh, working with pure Python. So we are defining points as tuples, constructing them in a list. Uh, so you have these, uh, so this was done by Swig, uh, the binding. So if you just look at the list, it's actually kind of ugly, not at all useful. But you can see that the print is defined. Uh, so here quite interestingly. So we have uh, the input and the output. So that was the input uh, from our running example of the previous lecture. Um, so, but the main point of this intercession is that I wanted to indicate uh, the lower hull and the uh, upper hull points. Um, also here, this is not a software course, uh, so we will not go much deeper into this. Uh, but if you would want a systematic overview, DIR uh, is uh, very good at seeing all the functions, everything that a module or a package exports. Okay, um, going back now to the mathematics, and we will stay now in the mathematics. Uh, so let me uh, now say the idea of the algorithm. Uh, there is the pre-processing. We sort all the points on uh, the x-coordinates. We compute the upper hull, walking from left to right, and then we compute the lower hull walking from right to left and then we add lower hull to upper hull you may have to be concerned there with the vertical edges uh, so you may have one vertical edge at the left one vertical edge at the right so this is the main idea of the algorithm uh, we will walk uh, i will define the algorithm for the upper hull if you know it for the upper hull then the lower hull will be an exercise. Okay, uh, now we get to the critical point. Um, so in some sense, the algorithm on the previous slide is sufficiently clear for a human to execute. But in this course, we don't compute everything by hand. Actually, we compute as little as possible by hand. So we want to give instructions, precise instructions to a computer to define how you should compute it. So let's see what we are doing. Uh, we are processing a list of sorted points, sorted on the first coordinate, so we can go from left to right. So we have an edge, P, Q. Uh, P and Q are both tuples, uh, so we denote their coordinates by the subscripts, not one and two, but subscripts X and Y. So we have to consider the next point. So this is an incremental algorithm. So we start with two points. We assume it's an edge. Uh, so we could now actually verify this with the algorithm of the previous lecture, but don't do this because that will immediately cost you n uh, steps of work. So we only consider the next point. And the next point, it makes sense. It could be very close. It could be the point that is next highest in, it is the point that is next highest in x coordinate. It's really to the right uh, scene. But do we make a right turn? Um, if that is the case, if we make a right turn, then yes, we have a new edge and we can continue. We can make a left turn. If we make a left turn, then actually the point Q cannot be on the upper hull. So the point Q has to be uh, deleted then from the list that we have already, from the list of upper hall points. It could still be that, don't delete it uh, completely, it could still be that the point is on the lower hall. But the point cannot be on the upper hall if you make a left turn. Right turn, left turn, what else can we do? Well, we can go straight uh, forward. Uh, so that will be the third case, so that's here the question mark. Um, so the right turn is handled. We have a new edge. Um, but at the left turn, uh, there is something special that may need to happen. So here I'm illustrating this by examples. Uh, so I'm building up the uh, arguments for the algorithm. We still need to prove the correctness. Uh, so because you can see if you want to work too fast, uh, you could have that you delete Q, 
but then you can see here for the example that if you don't delete p you actually don't have the upper hull uh, so at the upper hull you always need to make a right turn so you were making a right turn when you when we arrived at q but when we looked at r we would be making a left turn so that's not allowed if we compute the upper hull so we have to delete both p and q uh, and we may have to delete many more points. Um, so this is here just an example. Then there is the third case. Uh, this is going straight. Uh, in that sense, then we also have to replace uh, the point Q. So this is actually handling already the dead degenerate input. Uh, the case where we have points that are collinear. Um, all right, so now we have the upper hull algorithm. Um, so the idea, we start with two points. So now I label the points uh, with indices, not, not just P and Q. So we have a list of points. Um, so with the understanding that two consecutive points, uh, they make a, a right turn. So that is actually what the while loop here will uh, so there are actually only two statements here. Uh, so uh, it's a little bit confusing with the indentation, but the while, while the number of elements in that list is larger than two, you have at least three points to look at, you do delete as long as uh, they do not make a right turn. So if the last three points do not make a right turn, you delete the middle point. So that is where the multiple uh, deletions come in. Um, so this is the main. Uh, so again, uh, I should say that there is a primitive here. Uh, do not make a right turn. Uh, I will also not define here. So that was left off as an exercise in the previous uh, lecture what is a primitive uh, the primitive means that it takes a constant time so and uh, we can denote this with this big o of one so this is a time a, an operation that takes a constant time and there are primitives for deciding that uh, first exercise is to uh, formulate the lower hull algorithm and then uh, it's actually very straightforward. You process uh, the points in the opposite direction. So you start with the last point, uh, the last two points, that's the initialization. And then you replace the right by left. So two modifications. In the previous slide, I indicated what happens in case when you go straight. Uh, so then you also delete. Um, so in some sense, this is also covered a little bit. So the right turn, when you are collinear, that actually will also work. Uh, so in some sense, it might be that you don't have to modify anything uh, other than indicating that uh, there is actually a strict right turn. You can also then think about the other degenerate case. Uh, is this algorithm robust? So that's that's a, if you feel that not doing anything for an exercise is actually not really good. Okay, is this algorithm now correct? Um, okay, so let's look at a lemma. Um, so we have a correct upper hull algorithm. So the main theorem is that the entire algorithm is correct. But the critical lemma is here that the upper hull algorithm is correct four points in general position so we proceed by induction if we have only two points then we have a line segment and then uh, the points are not identical so it's not that degenerate so we have two points um, so we assume by induction that it is correct for up to the i minus one step so we do have the upper hull already for the first i points 
All we need to show that if we add an extra point, we will have the upper hull of the first I plus one points. So uh, if you work by induction hypothesis, you state uh, what is the induction hypothesis, and then you also explicitly state what needs to be proven. Um, all right, uh, so we look at the code now. Uh, so we have the instruction, which is actually one while loop. Um, so the pseudo code is a little bit confusing to Python programmers with the indentation, but it is a while do. Uh, although there are two do's in there, uh, so the AND uh, is uh, the construction, so there is here the AND, so that is the condition. Uh, so we have, uh, as long as we have three points, and these three points do not make a right turn, then we will uh, do delete the midpoint of the triplet. Okay, assume that uh, it would not be the upper hull so we are going to um, assume that after execution of this uh, while statement we would not have the upper hull so we are going to proceed by contradiction so then actually that would assume so we can actually do we, we, we could have this uh, but then actually we were not working on a correct. Uh, so in case where the points would actually make a right turn, and here you see this happens. So we make a right turn, but you see this happens if you make a right turn, then actually the x-coordinate of the i-th point is actually less than one of the points in between. So it would need, this could only happen if you forgot to sort your points on the x coordinates. So that cannot happen. So the assumption that we made um, arguing by contradiction is wrong. And that finishes uh, the uh, proof. Okay. Um, that was for a lower hull. Uh, I'm sorry, this was for upper hull. Now do this also for lower hull. That the lower hull algorithm, if you start from the rightmost point, and you make you make sure that you always make the correct turns, that that will give you the correct algorithm. Uh, so in some sense, exercise three follows exercise one. Um, the, so and then uh, exercise four follows exercise two. Okay, um, correctness is then implied. Uh, so there is the theorem that I haven't actually stated. If we have the correct, well, although the theorem should can only be stated after the exercises. So when the exercises are done, then you can say that we do have a correct algorithm. Okay, so this course follows uh, algorithms, uh, and the big O notation is already also introduced in earlier courses, often already in an introduction to computer science course. But for completeness, I have the formal definition of the big O here. So when we talk about uh, algorithms, uh, we have an input dimension, and we think about worst case scenarios, often being pessimistic. Um, so we say that this worst case scenario is a big O of n, if there is a function that is linear in n, uh, that is bounding. Um, so the f of n here can be n, can be n squared, can be n to the power 3. So there are constants uh, in there. We are interested in asymptotic costs. Uh, so asymptotic costs, that was in the definition of computational geometry. So asymptotically fast. Uh, so that means that for sufficiently large values. Uh, so there are certain startup costs. Uh, so if the n is very small, then actually the whole startup cost and the initialization, the allocation will actually dominate. Uh, so 
uh, it's that fixed cost that actually should no longer matter. Um, there are also the constants, uh, so we actually want that there is a constant independent of uh, the size of the problem, the number of points here. Um, okay, so this is a formal definition to make sure that uh, we all agree uh, what uh, the costs are, what the notations are. Uh, for practical purposes, uh, if we double the input for a linear time algorithm, the time will also be doubled uh, to compute the output. So there is a very straightforward relationship. If the algorithm has a quadratic cost, so many basic sorting algorithms, which are like insertion sort, bubble sort, they run in quadratic time, double the input, then uh, you have to wait four times uh, on average, the time that it takes to uh, process that list. Cubic cost is acceptable if you solve general linear systems. Not really acceptable in this course. Uh, we have quasi-linear time, n log n time. Uh, we also have logarithmic or sub-linear time, almost constant. That's the logarithmic. Um, that will be important when we uh, do queries, when we search geometric data structures. Okay, what is now the cost? Uh, so let's examine this. Uh, so we are looking again at the code. Uh, we see a loop. Um, so the loop, uh, the I loop, runs from 2 to n minus 1. So we will have the instructions in the body of the for loop um, done n times so it's at least n now why is it actually n so if you look at the statement of the lemma uh, first if you look at uh, the code so also here why do you need a proof of this well if you are looking at the code you see a for and a while loop the while is nested inside the for so it could be that this is quadratic um, so, and why is it not quadratic? So that needs proof. Uh, so that is formulated here in a lemma. Uh, so the first sentence in the proof actually st says it, it, the while loop may actually be more executed more than once. However, every time that you are executing uh, the while loop, you delete a point. Um, so actually, you have only n points, so you can never execute the while loop more than n times. That's the crux of the proof. Uh, again, uh, saying here that this is a primitive operation, it runs in constant time. So in some sense, it is a two-sentence or three-sentence proof. In uh, that sense, uh, it needs to be understood that we have our primitives well defined. Again, an exercise from the first lecture. Okay, I am actually at the end, almost at my slides. Uh, so here is the big conclusion. Um, in our first algorithm of the previous lecture, we were sorting at the end. And there actually it didn't really matter. Uh, that sort was n log n. If you had used the quadratic sort, it still wouldn't matter because we had a cubic cost. Here actually uh, the sorting, the pre-processing is actually the cost that dominates. Uh, so the computation of the upper hull runs in linear time, lower hull runs in uh, linear time as well and then by adding these two lists uh, so you may have to deal with vertical segments don't forget those uh, but adding up all the costs we actually have the n log n so here is where uh, this big o notation is important so if you have a constant number of times a constant o n's here three n's um, but it could be that so it's still big o it could be that for the adding the constant is different than the lower hull and upper hull because you have the cost of the primitives there um, 
The point I wanted to make is that the n log n is actually dominating. Okay, my last slide now. Um, so we have actually covered the entire first chapter already in the textbook. So we are done with the introduction. So the purpose of the lectures is that you can read the textbook. Um, that's actually the suggested activity. Um, this is the first week of classes. Uh, this is the second lecture in the middle of the first week. Uh, if you have not already done so, the first important activity is to install uh, Seagull on your computer. If you have problems with this, please see me. Um, so don't wait till the deadline of the first project, till the exams are there, because you uh, may have to be asked to use um, also Seagull. Uh, there are the exercises, uh, exercises on the slides, and there are the exercises in the textbook. I will not collect all of the exercises, only a selection of the homework problems. And I will make that uh, clear um, by the end of the first week of classes. Uh, perhaps already at the end of this uh, second lecture, we have already sufficient exercises for the first homework collection. All right, um, I went over time in the previous lecture. Here, actually, I will be able to uh, finish before the 50 minutes are done. So that is very good. So in the actual lecture, there will be time for questions and interactions.